And hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are Poll on the Call. My name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers. <laughs> and today we are here with episode 30, and we have the amazing Britta with us today. Thank you so much, Britta, You're for coming awesome. and willing to share your story with everyone. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm so excited. Do you want to take this off, Mandy, or shall I start it? Um, you, can, you can give it a start. Sure. So I guess we'll start something simple and easy. How did you first get into Paul? Uh, I actually started in 2012-ish, I believe. It's a long time ago now. Uh, self-taught, worked in the clubs for a little bit, uh, and was doing the self-taught thing for a while. And two or three years later, decided to get more serious about it, do teacher trainings and started a pole program in the little town I was living in. So you, were the... you started a whole program? Yeah, I was not surrounded by any studios or like formal training. So when I first started, I was traveling a lot to do traincations and that type of thing and uh, wanted to have a studio where I lived. So um, got my teacher training, uh, at the Vertitude in LA, it was super fun, and put up some poles in the aerial studio that I was training at, um, which was kind of an, another storyline. <laughs> um, and my friend Gracie helped me build a program there, uh, and she's actually since taken it over, and it's just gone like full force in this little town in Missoula. It's not really a little town anymore because co- over COVID, everybody moved there to Montana, but. Uh, yeah, so she runs that now, but uh, in 2016, uh, I started that, put the poles up in the aerial studio. <laughs> they were stage poles, so that was super fun. Um, and now since the studio's evolved and she has real poles and, you know, mirrors and all that stuff, but it was like very rinky dink to start, so. <laughs> That's awesome. So you were like the pole pioneer in the area. Um. As far as like the studios go, for sure, there were other women before people before me who uh, were self-taught and like had poles in their house or like worked in the club and uh, were a part of it in that way. But as far as I know, I was the first person to have a studio space, Um, which to be clear, I did not own it. I did not own the space. (laughs) Um, I was just like the I was the only instructor. So. I was like calling in my space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I always talk about like um, pole back then. It was like the Wild West because there was no like um, <laughs> like training training styles or anything like that. It was just like, here's a trick. We all learned it. And then, um, so it's really interesting that you came from just like self-taught and now you've developed this like whole training program that is so amazing and has helped so many people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a big reason why I do what I do is because I, you know, I don't regret my pole journey at all, but I do wish I could go back in time in some ways and just organize things a little bit. Like the first thing I learned was a cross knee release, like a layback, like before, like before I even like sat on the, like, it was just like, hook your leg like this and lay back. And like, I couldn't even like get up to like sit when I was out of it. I just kind of like handstand flipped out. Like what? Like, that's not, I don't know. It just wasn't like the best way to learn, but it was my way to learn. And it worked for me at the time. But when people ask, I'm like, don't do what I did. <laughs> so. I love that. That's my favorite call to the handstand after the lead back. If you can't protect them. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Worked at the time, but yeah, wouldn't recommend. <laughs> I love that your experience helped inspire um, what you do today. Cause, cause like it is really important. Like there's a progression of things <laughs> and it's, and we all need to follow them and just to be self safe and, and healthy and for longevity in our sport too. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely happy about all the safety recommendations that are the norm now that weren't the norm back then <laughs> yes wild west for sure <laughs> well and you started as as a dancer as many of us um do but did you have any um prior movement background or any dance yeah. background before then for sure so it's really funny 
that you asked that because now I coach cross training and weightlifting and I feel like somebody called me like the bro of the pole and aerial world <laughs> and I was like that's so funny because that is not how I perceive myself at all um like I am a dancer for sure like I've been dancing my whole life I did like competitive dancing in middle school and high school um lots and lots of yoga like kind of like got into acro that way um and from there that was kind of like where I got into like pole and uh, was doing the self-taught thing, whatever, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, pole journey from there on out. But my background is like through and through performing arts and dance and is not like meathead lifting <laughs> like it's on my Instagram. Like I'm for sure identify as a dancer who weight lifts versus like a weightlifter who dances. I love it so much. That's so funny. But I guess like to, to dancers who don't weigh lift, like you do kind of seem like. <laughs> I know, I get it. I totally get it. It's not like that came out of nowhere, but it's just, it made me think about my existence. <laughs> oh no. Oh my gosh. Have you found that your work in the cross training um, and the weightlifting helps with your full dancing? Definitely. That's another thing that I wish that I could kind of go back and teach myself like I did get into it fairly early I started lifting in 2017 and um I don't necessarily think that people need to start cross training right when they're learning pole or aerial like you just learn learn pole for the first like six months at least you know like you can do like little things at home or maybe like one workout per week but you don't need like a cross training program to get better at pole at that point but yeah, that was the game changer for me, for sure. Um, I have a lot of injuries from being a dancer <laughs> and like growing up in the 90s with dance culture was not injury prevention heavy at all. So yeah, um, like I'm hypermobile in a lot of joints and just I've got a lot of stuff going on. And the weightlifting was something that helped me just understand how to recruit more motor units in my body and like understand how to just push myself because I didn't really, I didn't really get that at first. Like I didn't really know what it meant to train and push myself. So that was the thing that lifting really taught me. And, you know, at the, like I was saying before, I just kind of fortified some things in my body. Like we can't prevent injuries, but it helps how I interact with my injuries and just help me learn more about my body. And that's what I love about what I do now is I get to be that person for other people. Cause I was just working with like a personal trainer who was like, okay, you're a pole dancer. I don't really know what to do with that, but we're going to teach you how to deadlift. <laughs> It'll be fun. And it was fun and it worked. Um, he was great, but it definitely would have been helpful to have somebody that understands the actual mechanics of what we're being asked to do and the culture of what's going on in pole. Cause I think other personal trainers that I talk with um, in like just the fitness industry, like not the pole industry are like, wait, some of your clients train for five hours a day. Like what is, I'm like, well, that's just like kind of normal. And like, you know, you go to a heels class, you stretch it out for half an hour, like in the lobby, and then you go to a tricks class and it's like five hours. So, um, yeah, it, it's definitely helpful to be able to interact with my clients in that way and like understand where they're coming from versus like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, what are we doing here? You know, kind of like freaks other people out. Man, I, I'm so happy that you also mentioned that you are hypermobile and you lift weights because um, that was something that I struggled with because I started lifting really heavy weights and I was compensating and I didn't realize I was compensating. So I was just hurting myself because I'm also hypermobile. But um, I thought for sure that you were not because you're you're there lifting heavy weights and, you know, um, you know, it seems to work for you. So I, I, I thank you. <laughs> yeah yeah setting, I mean, setting that example <laughs> ah, damn it because <laughs> I really like shied away from the gym after I was like oh man I really started hurting myself but this gives me hope that like I can still go back to the gym and maybe add that strength training back into my workout yeah for <laughs> sure and even though it maybe wasn't the type of weightlifting that you needed at the time like it probably still helped you understand something about how you move and what you're needing you know what I mean yeah maybe so. it did balance a little bit but for the most part I was like 
lifting heavier weights every single week just to like be competitive with myself for no reason and yeah I can't do that anymore <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's helpful to sorry my cat's all over the okay. place um, <laughs> she likes to be a part of things uh yeah it's I have a lot of hypermobile clients too and it's always a fun conversation because just the way you perceive your body is just a little bit different and um your needs are just a little bit different but I think most people are surprised at how similar my recommendations are for hypermobile dancers versus like typical dancers. Um, you know, not that there's a typical, but I'm just using that word for simplicity. Uh, and yeah, that hypermobile people can be doing for the most part, the same things that typical dancers can be doing. You. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny too. Like I um like I, I we were talking to Elizabeth B. Fit about this too. And it's funny because like they say our um the hypermobility is is like really rare, but every single person we talk to has at least one one or two joints that is hypermobile yeah. and we have to learn how to deal with them. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, yeah. Oh, huh? oh sorry, go ahead. I was just agreed. <laughs> ah, I didn't want to cut you off. Um yeah, I think 20% of population is, is hypermobile and mm. it seems to be somewhat prevalent in pole and circus spaces. Yeah. And I wonder if it's just because versus any other movement form or sport, we tend to be a little bit more like introspective about our bodies and how they work. And so maybe we just notice it more and hypermobile like hypermobility is actually more prevalent in general population than we think, but people just don't realize. I, I that's my only guess of why that could be. Hey, like imagine going through or, work. It's either that or what we're doing is causing it. Making it worse. <laughs> I mean, from what I know, it's not necessarily causing it, but I, I do think that it our sport asks a little bit more extreme positions of our body. And so we can just discover it a little bit more easily versus somebody else. You know, if you're golfing, you're not going to be like, oh my God, I think I'm hypermobile. I don't know. I don't really golf. So I'm just guessing. <laughs> right. There's like a whole subset of hypermobile golfers that like, <laughs> yeah, come out <laughs> through the woodwork and let us know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> if that's you, we want to hear from you. <laughs> A new podcast right here. <laughs> please, please, somebody make that. It'd be great. <laughs> Secret hypermobility. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you um, so you do you do pole and what other types of circus apparatus do you train on and, and teach on? I used to train a ton on silks and lira and as I was at one point in a circus troupe and traveling around performing silks lira that type of thing was kind of on a break from pole at that point and kept training silks and lira for a little bit but really started honing down on focusing on pole once they started the studio and um was just kind of mostly just doing that for the most part. But I did have a stint where I was really, really focused on performing and teaching um, silks and lira. And I still do go mess around on the lira, but not really the silks. I discovered I'm kind of a hard apparatus person. I don't really like, like I do like trapeze too, but there's not really any trapeze teachers besides Womack and Bowman in LA, but they're far from me, so. love that I want to try trapeze I want it's to fun <laughs> yeah if you like pole and you like the feeling of something yeah. rebelling against you <laughs> your <laughs> tissues um and like the challenge of interacting with like the hard apparatus it's super it's very similar in that way like it's very similar interaction whereas like fabric you know cordelis and vertical silks and hammock that kind of stuff is like whoa like this is why is this moving around me it's just different you know yeah, can't wait one day for sure <laughs> yeah yeah trapeze bruises super fun <laughs> oh my gosh that's so awesome how you've trained on so many different apparatus 
I'm, that means you have probably a lot of clients that are like all over with different circus stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and you do, yeah. do you develop like individual programs for each person or do you have like, wow. <laughs> Yeah. So for each of my custom clients, we meet, we talk, we do a mobility and a movement screening and do a training audit, talk about what they're doing right now, where they see themselves in a few months, where they see themselves in a year, what their like wildest pole and circus dreams are. And then from there, we create a program to kind of meet them at the point between where they're at, where they want to be and kind of like mix in some of those wildest dream preps uh in there and so yeah each person's program is totally individualized it's a mix between weightlifting obviously um and contortion technique too because that's also something I really love and is a great mix with weightlifting stuff so I do also have a generalized program it's my level up for aerial artist program and that's a average program of what I would program for my custom clients and that you can just download uh, and it's yours forever kind of thing. Uh, And that's, again, just a mix of what I would program for the typical aerial or pole artist and what that person would be needing to just improve on general strength and flexibility. That's awesome. I love that. And do you have a link so we could share that in the YouTube and in the podcast notes? Yeah, definitely. I will send that over to you guys. And since it's so personalized, how do you, how do you balance like your work and practice schedule? Do you have like, are you like taking new clients or are you like full? Um, How do you do that? I am full for custom clients. And by the time this comes out, I will probably have released the wait list for an intensive that I'm going to be running in the winter. So we're currently in test mode for the intensive right now. And uh, we're going to open it to the public in the winter. So the wait list will be open for that. And I'm also taking on new custom clients in October, but I am full for now. <laughs> and it's been such a journey, like experiencing what it means for me to like be you know, at capacity, that type of thing. Cause we want to do all the things. I think it comes with the pole dance culture <laughs> that we're like, and say yes to everything. And I really had to learn that about myself for work as well. And, um, <laughs> I always enjoy smashing this fantasy for people that becoming an instructor or a coach for pole and aerial artists does not mean that you're training pole and aerial <laughs> all the time, because I'm definitely not uh, my people come first and, uh, I do have early mornings and that type of thing to work around. And, you know, I use the same suggestions that I suggest to my clients that either have muggle jobs or instructors also, you know, you gotta not expect yourself to go balls to the wall every day. One, because that's not even a helpful way to train really. And two, it's not a realistic expectation with, taking care of your own students and clients or taking care of your muggle job, depending on what you do. Um, and also to just kind of like set your life up in a way that supports you. You know, I'm doing just as much computer work <laughs> as anybody else, which always surprises people. Um, and it's super important to take movement breaks and not shock your body with, with the contrast of sitting for three hours doing computer work and then going and doing this really intense sport <laughs> and uh, like asking these extreme positions of your body and I think that can be kind of a shock to the nervous system. So I do always encourage people to find that balance of building a life that revolves around your training, but not necessarily training all the time. Right. Yeah. That you that. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's a lot to juggle. Cause like, I, I, I guess I wonder like, cause your social media content is so amazing and it's so well put together. Um, and do you do all of that yourself too? Yeah, I, for the most part, some of the design stuff I've outsourced to a company called Shared Culture Concepts, and they're a marketing company for specifically circus and performing artists, and it's awesome. Like, they're really great. Highly recommend. But for the most part, yeah, all of the stuff is me talking. Uh, A lot of the designs are them. But yeah, for the most part, you know, I just kind of share what I've learned and my experience and a little bit of my weird self and you know 
it's and, and if you're perceiving it that way that probably means that like you are that way also you know because the important thing about being on social media is knowing that you're not going to be for everybody and it's in your best interest to just share what you know stick to what you know and be yourself and the people that are attracted to that are going to be attracted to that and like some people won't be and it's not worth it to try and like talk to everybody or please everybody and then the people that you're attracting are really similar to you and you know have the same sort of knowledge base um want to know more about it value the same sort of things that you value and you know and then here we are having this awesome conversation because you're most likely the same way so yeah, I mean, I mean, I found you on Instagram. I've been following you for quite a while. And um, your posts are always so informative and also inspirational um, and humorous. <laughs> but yeah, I noticed you're not on like YouTube or anything else. And I wondered how you um, like built such a huge following just on Instagram. Or did you have some other route that, that um, built your um, your business? That's my way, your main way of connecting with people. Yeah, I think that a lot of it came from just working with my initial client base. And then, of course, all of those people attend studios or, you know, have friends in the polar circus community. And I, I really think it was just kind of a, what would you say, a bubble map type thing, <laughs> like a dispersion of just kind of like word of mouth type of thing. So yeah, Instagram is my main thing. And I really do like, I know everyone says that you should have like, you know, YouTube videos. And I have like one educational YouTube video up, I think. Um, and like, I don't have a Facebook page, which I know I like, quote unquote, need to work on. It's just like not important to me right now. But yeah, just Instagram. It's my favorite social media platform. And I just kind of poured all my energy into that one. And I really enjoy connecting with people on there. So it seemed the most worth it. Excellent. Well, it was probably mostly word of mouth because <laughs> you're so awesome. <laughs> but I also Thanks. like Instagram and I just always wonder like with all the shadow banning and everything, like how hard it is just to like maintain one form of social media or if we have to like join TikTok and all the other everything. <laughs> for sure. And I think that that's a really serious concern, especially for sex workers and strippers and people with OnlyFans that like are in the community and need the platform like I you know I, I use the platform and I quote unquote need it for my business and I enjoy using it but you know I've got a mailing list and other ways of connecting with people it's not going to like it's not going to be super detrimental to me but I know that it's a more serious problem for people um that actually you know are super affected by shadow banning and that type of thing and you know, I, I really hope that at some point it changes, but, um, for most people, like, again, I don't really have the same concerns as the people that really need it, but for most people, I probably wouldn't recommend like dumping all of your energy into Instagram because who knows what's going on with that yeah. weird platform right now. <laughs> right. Like the future is so uncertain. Yeah. It's like become a very weird vortex. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for sharing a little bit about the the business side of like being a, a pole entrepreneur because that's something a lot of us wonder about. And um, you know, we want we all want to make money doing what we love. So, thank you for sharing that. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And then I the other thing though, and I know because I was like, oh, you were uh you were in a pole competitions and you were. <laughs> and I tried to find some of your videos, but there was no evidence. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that was on my other YouTube. Speaking of the YouTube, I think that was on my other YouTube account that I blended with my educational one. I'll, I'll, I'll put them back up eventually. So <laughs> I, when I started doing what I was doing, I took down a lot of my performance stuff because I didn't want people to be confused about what I was teaching. Um, because a lot of people would hit me up for choreography consults and stuff like that. And I, not that I don't love that, but it's just not what I'm focused on right now. So I think that was confusing for people. So I took a lot of my performance stuff down and 
now that you say that, I think I'll probably put them back up at some point just to, you know, have the evidence out there. But yeah, I competed for, I only did it for like three years between um, 2017 and 2020. Um, And I definitely loved it, but it's a lot of stress. (laughs) Right? Like it's, it is a lot of stress. And it's not for yes. everyone, but you liked it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience competing? And what was your favorite competition? So my favorite competition was probably my first one in 2017, uh, primarily because I love to tell people that I trained for it on those freaking stage poles in our studio. Uh, <laughs> just be like, look, it is possible like, to use whatever resources you have available it's great if you want to join a competition team at a studio and like have all the support and resources, but it can be done on your own with whatever poles you happen to have. Like, I think I ran it once I drove three hours to like a different studio to run it on the actual poles one time, but that was pretty much it. Um, but for that reason, that was my favorite one. Uh, and yeah, I definitely enjoyed it and I enjoyed pushing myself in that way. But again, this was still kind of in the era where I was learning how to push myself. And I didn't really understand that, like, I didn't need to have this, like, wild intensity towards it, like, every single day. And it was okay to have days where I just mark the routine and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I also did, like, a bunch of different types of competitions, which was kind of cool for me. Like, I don't always recommend that you need to like do competitions that aren't your strength to like, you know, challenge yourself or round yourself out, you know, like you can just like take a power pole class. If you're not a power puller, like you don't need to like do the OG competition. Like I did, like I'm not a power puller. And that was so stressful for me. That was like not my type of competition at all. I definitely like more flow and more, yeah. And just, I don't, I don't need to be in the air for the entire routine like that recommends that you do. Play to your strength. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Thank, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> do you still perform or um, um, outside the competitions? I know you said you stopped. Do you still get to perform at least? Not right now. I have taken a break from it to build my business and just focus on my clients. And I think that if I got back into performing, I would want to perform contortion. And I don't think I'm quite at the point yet where I like want to put that on stage. So I'm kind of like waiting to see where my path takes me with that. Cause it's definitely on my mind to get back into it. And like, I see my clients competing and performing and I'm like, ah, I miss it. But at the same time, I'm like, I do not have the neural bandwidth for that right now. So I'm just going to make, try to make the smart decision. So. Right. It does take a lot. <laughs> for sure. Know, it's, hard, it's hard to say like no to the performing of the competition for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even like student showcases and stuff, um, Embody, which is the closest studio to me is doing their like, you know showcase preparation and performance and like I think a couple of months and I was like oh that could be a fun thing to get back into I was like you don't need that right now <laughs> <laughs> on top of everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> I will say though we are having a free showcase and if you want to send just 30 seconds of a conditioning exercise we would love it <laughs> yeah it would be a very very interesting <laughs> showcase it would be just me flexing my biceps and being the apparent bro that I am we like presenting the bro of the pole world no we would never never ever do that to you (laughs) I might not mind unless you posted it first yeah (laughs) oh my gosh well do do you have any um what is some advice that you would give um new polers uh again going back to the whole just learn pole like just learn pole for the first six months like you don't need to put any pressure on yourself to do all sorts of flexibility training and cross training and all that stuff you can do little things to take care of yourself and like recover maybe a workout here and there but 
most people are like super disappointed to know that <laughs> like, you know, you don't need to be doing a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, and yeah, I also recommend working with a bunch of different coaches and figuring out what you like, um, figuring out like what type of coaching works for you, figuring out like what type of dancing you want to focus on. I mean, not that you really even need to, like if you want to just kind of like do a bunch of different stuff for the, throughout your pole journey, like that's great too. But in the beginning, like work with as many people as you can go to as many studios, like do the traincations later on, like do the strength programs, do the flexibility programs, just like experience it all. And like work with as many people as possible, figure out what type of coaching style resonates with you. Um, and like lock into your people and what works for you. Cause again, like there is a lot of coaches in the space. Like there's a lot of instructors in the space and you like everyone's not going to be for everybody. So, uh, yeah, just like dive in and do all the things. Yes. I love that you mentioned trying other people because oftentimes I find some people would try just one class or one teacher and then no matter, like depending on what happens, they won't return. And I try to encourage them, come back, even if it's someone else. If you don't like my class, that is perfectly okay. But keep trying it because you'll find something that you like. Right. And then the people who find your class and love your class, like you're their instructor. And like they're going to learn from you and trust you. And it just makes for a better relationship. Uh, but yeah, you have, to, you have to try a bunch of different things. And the other reason I recommend that is because there's a lot of training philosophies out there. There's... I don't know. We're not like soccer. There's not like a way that you learn how to do this really. Uh, and so it can be helpful to just have some different viewpoints on you and your training and your body. So you don't get these ideas of like, oh, so-and-so instructor like said this about my hip and like, I need to be doing this for my hip. Like, and then, you know, and like, maybe that's not even like what you're needing. And so it can be helpful to have some different eyes on your body and how you move and just so you can get some different perspectives on what you really need so that you're not locked into like this one way of training or this one way of thinking about your body or your movement. That's so true. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad that you mentioned the different like training philosophies and teaching styles of teachers, because it really does um, vary and it depends on the teacher's background and their personal thoughts and feelings about everything too. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And what their goals are for you. Yeah. Because yeah, some instructors yeah. want you to be that like power pole or OG, like, you know, aerial pole person. <laughs> like the goal, like the ultimate goal is Fonji's kind of thing. <laughs> and that was never my teaching style, really. Um, I was more performance oriented and more creative oriented of like find your self-expression and find what type of you know movement feels the most like yourself like I was very like abstract style instructor so I love that though because it, it it's it is perfect because all of our bodies are different and we each need to find our own voice so it is like that's a really good philosophy. <laughs> and I was gonna yeah. ask you about your philosophy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So when I was instructing, that was that was kind of my jam. I was like very free dance oriented, even if we were doing tricks, I was still freestyle at the beginning and uh like figuring out kind of like different uh ways that you can interact with your tissues and different tricks and stuff like that. Um yeah, very abstract instructing style which I think also had to do with how I started pull and just like being on my own for so long. Like I had to figure out how my body interacted with different tricks. Cause I just was the only option of <laughs> the way of figuring it out. Um, but now my instruction style, I just, it's a different thing, like with cross training. Um, and because I work so one-on-one -on -one with people in general, I'm very educational and very in formative with my cueing and my style like I really want people to understand and process the reason behind what they're doing um which is kind of a lot of what I do with my mini classes too they're basically um it's my membership like my subscription service um it's like 10 to 20 minute classes which is basically just me like talking about the drills that we're doing and like leading you through them and helping people understand why we're doing what we're doing and how they can 
implement this into different parts of their training and like what this is actually for. Um, so yeah, I uh, like, which kind of like, sounds like it's the opposite of what I was teaching with pole in the studio, but it does, it does tie together. Cause I really do believe that like freedom and creativity and training come from structure and strength. And, you know, some people do well with using all their time creatively, but that's, I think that's a very specific personality and most people do much better with creating structure and like having an understanding of what their body is needing and having an understanding of what their training week is needing. Um, and you probably don't need as much time as you think to be training because a lot of people end up training in circles um, and getting frustrated with like their failure to be creative or their failure to like get this trick or whatever. When in reality, they're just like putting too much pressure on themselves to do that thing and like the creative the creativity and the success come from like the structure so um yeah that's that's a big part of my like cross training philosophy as well as the um I'm really big on encouraging people to lock in on a goal uh and structure your training around that because like worst case scenario you learn some cool shit about your body and like you progress in other ways towards a different goal that you care about more and now you know that and best case scenario you achieve that goal and you celebrate and move on and like a lot of people get really freaked out like locking into a goal and they're like oh my gosh the rest of the class is moving on to pegasus and like i'm still working on this and it's like it's okay it's okay if you want to like focus on what you were learning in the class before and like really hone in on that like worst case scenario you improve your shoulder mobility and then four weeks later when you do move on to pegasus you're gonna freaking nail that thing so that's my that's how i guide a lot of my clients Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really important for students, especially new ones too, to understand that like, um, you know, everyone progresses at a different rate, <laughs> depending on what you've done with your body during your life and like how you, yeah. your body understands things. And, and I like also that you mentioned that, you know, that not like all the tricks are there, but you can have creative freedom in them and, and they're not always like static and, and this is always this. And if you can't For do it sure. this way, <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really true. It's, um, it's just kind of going back to what you were saying about your experience with lifting is that like, you got to adjust things so that your individual tissues and your individual like neuro system interacts with it in the best way. And I think that can be the same with tricks and contortion technique and you know, we got to adjust things that work for ourselves because, you know, we all, the rest of our bodies are exactly like our fingerprints, you know, and yeah. like no one thing is going to be the best thing for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Like in my situation, I didn't know how hypermobile I was. So I really needed to know who I was first <laughs> Yeah, in order to help properly train my body so that I that's why your individualized training is really important for pole dancers. For sure. And also just like, even if you don't do a program that's individual, just having the mindset that like, oh, even though I don't look exactly how I think this should look, or I'm not really, I don't think I'm implementing the cues exactly. I feel like I'm getting something out of this and that's what's important. And that's what actually is helpful. <laughs> Nice. Well, um, we talked about your training philosophy, but um, how often do you train and what are some types of things that you do to, to train? Give us yeah, like a typical so, week. So it depends on what type of training cycle I'm in, <laughs> which is something I talk about a lot on my Instagram. And that is the one educational YouTube video that I have up. <laughs> um, it's like how to create structured training blocks and uh, create these focused, like, like four to eight week blocks of whatever it is, whatever training modality you're going to be working on during that training block. So I, for the last five weeks have been in a flexibility and strength training block, which is like typically what I'm doing right now, mostly because it works best for me to be focused on that. Cause I have to like test a lot of stuff for my clients and I, you know, it's getting a lot of my energy anyway, and I love it. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm doing a lot of contortion and weightlifting right now and like blending of the two. So 
right now, like over the last five weeks or so, I'm in my last week right now, I've been doing um, contortion once a week and lifting twice a week. And previous to that, I was doing um, contortion two to three times a week and lifting twice a week. So this is kind of like my higher intensity, like lower frequency training block. Um, and then the next training block I'm going to go into will be super fun. Cause it's going to be like reintroducing some pole skills and muscle building. So, uh, that'll be fun for like, you know, both aesthetic and skill reasons. And I just haven't really been working on a lot of pole skills over the last like six or so months. Like I think the last time I went through like a pole skill training focused, um, mesocycle which is the training block was in January where I was working on like funny that I was saying I'm not a power puller because I was working on a lot of like dynamic stuff so um I don't think I'll do that again but that's kind of that's what I'm working on and how I train right now and how most of my clients train that's just structured training I'm like I'm like wow (laughs) <laughs> and I mean, I do a very extreme version of it because for me, again, I'm researching a lot of like what works and like what I, um, like what I want to do and what might work for other people. And I enjoy the structured aspect of it. You don't have to be that freaking organized. And like a lot of my clients do, because that's the reason they start working with me is they want to be super organized and They want every training minute accounted for and like calculated and whatever. And like, I think that's super fun, but it's, it's just like, it's just a way to track it. It's just a tool to, um, like understand what you're working on. There are definitely there, this definitely exists in a soup, a spectrum of ways that you can integrate it. Like you can just go through like a five week cycle where you're super focused on, handstand work or you can go through a cycle where you're super focused on flexibility tricks and like it doesn't it doesn't have to be like oh my god like this is all optimized and whatever like I just do that because I'm a freak and it's not necessarily like something everyone needs to do like you can get great results both ways no I I love that actually because I think that a lot of us do get overwhelmed they're like I have to practice flexibility strength all of this stuff like all at once but you, you have like a cycle of things and you come back to them. And then yeah. like you said, you're going to come back to your pole tricks and you're going to be fucking amazing <laughs> after all of like, the strength <laughs> training and flexibility that you've done. Your, your tricks will be hopefully like more easier. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. That's very encouraging. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely hard to like let stuff fall on the back burner, like over this last training block I've gotten back a couple of contortion tricks that I was super psyched about and I got my feet super close to the floor with my chest stand and now I'm gonna let that stuff go on the back burner and it's probably gonna get worse like when I come back to it um in September it will be worse like my feet will be farther away from the floor probably um some people's bodies when they take a break from it they come back and like it's better and like there's I don't really know the exact science of why that's happening besides just like letting your body get more balanced but um yeah just acknowledging that I know that it's hard <laughs> and when I tell people to like take a step back from stuff I'm not just saying that to be mean it's because I want you to like be able to go balls to the wall with the stuff you are focused on so yeah hopefully the tricks will look as cool as Mandy thinks they will <laughs> they will but yeah, you're right though. Like we can't just like a lot of the stuff, the contortion takes a lot of focus. Like you really have to be into it. You can't just like half-ass and do contortion and handstands and like expect to be amazing at all of the things at the same time. Definitely. <laughs> That's good. I, I like that training portion. It's something I hadn't really thought about. And I think that'll be helpful for a lot of people like me who um, just continue this thing. They're like, Oh, I have this training schedule and I'm going to continue it for the rest of my life. And then yeah. it becomes boring and <laughs> for sure. And I, again, I just, I really can appreciate this because I feel it too. Like I'm so freaking stoked on my chest and progress. I truly am. But like, it's like, it's just like, it's just how it is. Like if I want everything to come together, like, it's just, I'm going to have to take a little deload from it and it's okay I also just have like a very 
firm appreciation for what we see on Instagram and how it can affect our perception of what everybody else is training allegedly. Um, when I first moved to LA to like pursue this, that was the reason that I was moving there was to work with the instructors here and kind of like, you know, not be having a traincation every time I wanted to train, (laughs) um, and like learn from somebody because we didn't really have virtual things then. Um, but I had this crazy expectation of myself that like I was training for OG Um, I was like going to go to this heels class every week and the tricks class that came after it. Um, I also like got a couple of teaching jobs. So I was teaching like twice a week and then I was going to go to the conditioning class at this other studio and like train for the showcase there. And just like, I just like thought everybody was doing that. I really, really thought that everyone was just training everything and something was wrong with me that I like couldn't keep up. So I think that's just important to point out. That's exactly what I thought up until just a few moments ago. (laughs) (laughs) Great. (laughs) Yeah, it's super, super real. And it's very frustrating and it's very discouraging. And it's just not, it's not reality. Hardly anyone is doing that. And the people that are, aren't doing it long term. Like what you're seeing is like, you know, you follow this person and you notice that they're doing all this stuff for maybe a couple months. And then in your mind, you're like, oh, they must have just been doing that for years, you know, and there really is no reason to be training that many hours a week, unless your goal is to be training that many hours a week. Like if you love it and you're like, I freaking want this training schedule. And like this training schedule is my goal. Okay. Let's train you for super high frequency and train you to be just like attending all these classes. Cause that's what you want to do. And like, it's your social thing. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but like Most people will say, oh, that's actually not my goal when you frame it that way. But if you're listening, that is, that's okay too. (laughs) (laughs) But you're right though. um, People are happiest when they're working toward a goal and the goal can't become stale. Like it needs to evolve. And, and then you can, like you said, you can make the goals in your contortion training and then go to the different cycle and make the goals in your handstand training and then keep cycling through. And that's sounds like a really healthy way to to practice? (laughs) Um, Sometimes it can be. (laughs) Um, I also get, I get very like attached to things. Um, I only say that because I just know that a lot of times when people listen to coaches, it sounds like this, uh, you should be doing this and you should be doing that thing. And that's just, that's not the case with these guidance tips that I'm giving. It's that like I've discovered these for myself and like this is how my brain (laughs) works and I'm like telling myself also I'm not like shaking my finger at you crazy people you know (laughs) I love it (laughs) well um let me see do you have uh where do you see yourself in the future do you think you'll continue with your um like personal training and all that or yeah I I really I see myself just doing some version of this and what I'm currently doing. I'm super happy with uh, the way that I feel helpful and I'm super happy with the way that I get to work and the things I get to study. And I spent a long time in the pole and performing arts industry, kind of experimenting with different versions of myself and what felt like I was truly contributing to the world and things like that and I I think this is it um I mean it will evolve you know like we never like are fully never like fully arrived or anything like that but this definitely feels like the most in my place I've ever felt so uh besides just the possible reintegration of performing I I I even think that would be like a pretty intermittent thing and um yeah, I, I see me just kind of doing the same thing I'm doing now. Right, like going with the flow and just doing what you love and being authentic. You <laughs> hope so. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, again, I'm just, I really love this. And just through all the like iterations of a coach and a dancer, I've been, this feels like you were saying the most authentic, so. Do you have any other, like, do you do anything other than your coaching, any other hobbies or jobs or anything like that? 
Yeah. Um, when I'm not doing this, I'm usually in nature in some way. Uh, I used to be like a huge camper, which Orange County is like not really the best place to do that. So mostly just hiking. Um, but yeah, huge nature girl. Um, also love art. Like I keep an art journal and I do all that stuff. Like I love painting um, and hanging out with my fiance. We're getting married in November. So that's that's what my quote unquote free time is <laughs> um, being dedicated to. Thank you. Yeah, we're super psyched. So much happening to you guys. Thanks. Yeah, we're we're super excited and um like he owns his own business too so we're kind of just doing doing the things together yeah so back to traveling in the future hopefully that would be awesome yeah yeah definitely we yeah we do love to travel as well travel to nature is the thing <laughs> <laughs> i did have a side a random question oh yeah because um, i love asking this what is, was your favorite pole trick or is your favorite pole trick? And what was like your pole nemesis? Like the trick you hated, it took you forever. Uh, favorites are definitely gargoyle, bird of paradise, anything flexible, love that stuff. Um, nemesis, this is not my nemesis in like a classic way of talking about nemesis, but cross angle release, I freaking hate. It's not worth it to me, it's so scary. Um, I don't like two point inversion style stuff, um, like even handsprings and like elbow Aisha and stuff. It's just like, I like to have a lot of skin on the pole, <laughs> which is why I like flexibility <laughs> tricks. Uh, I'm definitely not like a daredevil bowler, um, but yeah, no, I, mm, no, no to the, no to the cross ankle yeah. release. So kudos to you <laughs> if your nervous system can handle that. <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> oh my god! Yes. Also mine. <laughs> Wait. So how how high up are you? How do you do it from the top? I mean, I mean, I can and I yeah. don't mind doing it. Same, yeah. <laughs> I don't teach it from the top. <laughs> but you would, like, you would oh, for yeah. fun. And I have, yes, yeah, so I love it. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm a drop. I'm like yeah, Chris a drop. Likes dude. drop yeah. Like, I like specialize and love the drops. Those are my favorite. Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> See, and this is why it's so I, important to have different coaches. Uh, I wish I could yeah. do the flexibility stuff. I'm working on it though. So kudos to you. <laughs> but like drop. that came more, that was not like a big challenge to me. Like that was, I mean, not that like Bird of Paradise wasn't a challenge for me, but like uh it, it just felt like a more natural thing to work on versus like oh I want to scare my audience <laughs> you know oh my gosh I'm working on the bird of paradise and so far but so close yeah <laughs> it's such a fun challenge though and it's like there, there's just so much going on flexibility wise like more than I think a lot of muggles realize and yeah. a lot of people that aren't working on it realize so it, yeah, it's definitely, ha it definitely has a lot of moving parts and mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really, really fun challenge. So yes, I Good definitely for you. want to try, but I'm going to wait like a year or two because my flexibility is definitely better than it was, but I'm not there. So it's my goal <laughs> to be a big ass man doing a bird of paradise. <laughs> you can do a flexibility <laughs> tricks training cycle. <laughs> Yeah, see where that true, takes is. you. Oh my gosh, such a good <laughs> idea. Rita, this has been amazing. I'm going to like have so much work to do and on my own personal self. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank so you so offer, much for having me. <laughs> so you offer a, because I know you're not taking clients, but you do offer a program for anyone who just want, like wants a system or a guide. And that's yep. the end of link you give us. Okay. Yeah. So I have a couple of different things available right now. One is the strength and flexibility program, which is kind of a, a mix of my general recommendations for my pole and aerial clients. Um, and I'll send you the link for that. And that's for if you want to go into a strength and flexibility training cycle, and it is organized to be a training cycle. So it's six weeks. Um, you can do it for six weeks, take a deload go into a different training cycle and then do it again. 
um, or like you can build it upon itself six weeks after six weeks after six weeks. If you want to stay in a strength and flexibility training cycle, which is kind of like what I do for myself. Um, so that's what that is. That's more like of an overtaking kind of thing. Uh, and then I also have the mini classes, which are my on-demand classes, which is more mobility and movement snacks. Uh, there are a couple lifts in there and workouts that are a little bit more higher intensity, but that's really just so you can kind of see what my training style is. And the rest of the classes are mobility, flexibility, movement, snack style stuff that you can get up from your computer and do as I recommend. Um, and then there's some educational stuff in there too, just for people that want to know more about how it works. I mean, they're all educational because I talk a lot, but uh, there are some specifically educational videos for people that just want to know how this approach works in bodies and how they can explain it to their students kind of thing. So um, yeah, I have that. And then um, I have the wait list opening soon for the intensive, which is um, going to be open to the public in it's starting in the winter, the wait list will be open to the public in a couple of weeks. So that'll be just a more accelerated way of doing the custom programming. Um, so we'll do custom programming and some group coaching stuff. And there's some more FaceTime with me as you go along. So you can kind of like have some more eyes on your training, that type of thing. So. So much stuff for students and teachers. Yeah, definitely. I have a lot <laughs> of instructors. <laughs> nice. I love it. Because we're yeah. always learning, always learning. <laughs> Same. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I think I think that was all the questions that I had to ask. Chris, do you have anything? Oh, common question. What grip do you use? Or oh uh, yeah, I was multiple <laughs> grips do you use? I used to use dry hands a lot. Um, and I've been exper experimenting with the monkey hands, and I really do like it. So I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to be in that camp for a while. <laughs> Somebody else mentioned monkey hands yesterday and I was like, oh, maybe I'll look into this. Now you're the second person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of similar. To, it's similar yeah. to dry hands. Like it's not, it's not, I don't need like dew point because I'm super oily. Um, yeah. It's a, a dry one, like a chalk. Uh, and yeah, yeah. I've, I've been liking that just because. I don't know. Jerry hands is weird. <laughs> uh, right? Same. <laughs> so. <laughs> nice. Do you find that your grip has to change for the seasons or out in California? Do you guys have seasons? Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, by seasons, I guess I mean, like, depending on where I'm living, because um, uh, we don't have seasons here, <laughs> yeah. which like it's great for pole like you're pretty much always warm like I think I turned the heater on in the studio like once when I was teaching um but you do get super freaking hot which is why I was like you know needing all the chalk and whatever and that really sucks and you know uh grip strength you can only train so much like your forearms are only so big and like you can only release so much of your medial nerve tension like <laughs> there's not really a whole lot you can do so um, but yeah, I love training though. <laughs> this is going to sound so funny, but like in the fall on the East coast, right. Do you, you guys feel like that's a good time? Like for polling? Yeah. I feel like it's like the perfect amount of humid. So you're not super dry, but it's also not like really hot and sweaty. My favorite is winter. I, I don't okay. know if that's just my body type. I love pulling in winter. <laughs> Mine's summer Over right here. now. <laughs> I can do all the tricks in the summer, and then the winter I just slide down. <gasps> Weird. Okay. So, yeah, we're all different. There's no rhyme or reason. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Mandy, you must be really dry, and yes. Chris, you must be oily like me. <laughs> oh, I could be a moist. <laughs> like maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That might explain why I need like a lot of the dry, like chalk, like I like that. And the gorilla powder is my shit. I love that stuff. For Ooh, okay. The rock stuff, it works amazing. Oh, I haven't tried that. What do you like about it? Um, They have like multiple different um levels. So they have a real strong grip one, the blue one. And it's just a powder. It's like a, um, a bag full of powder. 
take out oh. his pants, put it on, and it dries your hands real quick. That's badass. That's like gymnast style. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I love it. I really do. Dang, At least like it's on the floor, so beware of the small mess. But yes. That's <laughs> you, Chris? I'm just kidding. Not anymore. I put a towel now. <laughs> just kidding. Oh my gosh. There's so many different grips out. We always have to ask. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, um, I also, I feel like I went through a phase using the firm grip and yeah. then it was like, this is too much work to clean off the poles. And it, like most studios don't even allow it anymore. Cause it's it just, it's messy, but I did like it. Cause I was like, Ooh, I don't have to do any work. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <It's stick. laughs> yeah. See for me, the firm grip is too sticky and it like, it doesn't come off of me at all. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, I have heard that the firm grip is really good for, like, harder tricks, just so you, like, have confidence to stick onto the pole. Just, yeah, just if you're, like, <laughs> for motor learning time, so you're not, like, wasting time hanging yeah, up there. Yeah. Not for, like, conditioning, you know what I mean? But, like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, look how strong I am. I put yeah. all over my body. <laughs> yeah. But you want these strength programs. <laughs> it's just the firm grip. It's all, it's all an illusion. <laughs> They're not <I'm> me. <laughs> That's the real secret is you do a strength training program by firm grip and you know, just amaze yourself. <laughs> the training program comes with it. It does. <laughs> Oh, no, gee, that that is, um, that'd be a good commission for you <laughs> if you promote the firm grip with your trading program <laughs> yeah yeah oh man I don't I feel like they're not going to want to be associated with this. <laughs> <laughs> they're like okay. no please keep us out of your mess <laughs> we don't want your promo <laughs> Well, well, Britta, thank you. This has been so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. so great to meet y'all. We've been, I know we've been talking a little bit on Instagram and email and all that. So it was great to put a face to the name. And uh, what, what studio do y'all teach out of? Oh, uh, Pole in the Wall in Springfield. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. I just wanted to have the name in my head. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was your studio? I, when I was teaching here, I was teaching at Embody. And Embody. yeah, um, bunch of studios in LA and then the one in Montana was previously mask uh it the aerial studio was called mask artisans and now it's turned into pole fiction now that it's only pole oh. so yeah it's a spin on pulp fiction because the owner, <laughs> the owner oh, yeah. gets, gets down on some pulp fiction so yeah it's called <laughs> pole fiction in Missoula uh super awesome they just moved into a super rad new space with it's not stage poles so you know always good oh my gosh I can't even imagine learning on the stage pole like even just doing a photo shoot on the stage pole I'm like this sucks it does (laughs) you have every right to think that (laughs) but performances though it always adds like that that element of like oh my gosh because like for sure are they gonna fall Don't right yeah it, they're like more stable than people think for sure and it's, they are yeah, yeah yeah and it's cool to have like I mean we're lucky that we get to like bring our aerial apparatus places but don't recommend in terms of like having them as your studio pole it was only because the, <laughs> the, the, ce- the ceilings were like 30 feet so we had like no other choice wow, yeah yeah because <laughs> it was silks oh man OMG, I'm like, I have a performance in Cape Cod coming up. I'm like, it's on a float, and I think it's a stage float. Stage <laughs> float on a float, Chris. <laughs> oh my God, fun. It'll be it moving at like fun, five miles an hour, though. You two just and scared the hell out of me. Your cross ankle release is going to look great on a float. I yes. know this. Oh my God, yeah. Right at the top. I think there are rails in case it tips. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Chris, you're going to be amazing. That would be fun. <laughs> Bring my daredevil skills to the next level. Yeah, totally. That's a good, that's a good skill for, that's a good skill for a float, I feel. Yeah, the booking agent in me senses this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It was so great to meet you. And I look forward to listening with everyone and yeah, connecting with you in the future. Yeah. Yeah, And thank you so much for your amazing content. We'll continue sharing it and, (laughs) and hope that your, um, your story and everyone inspires everyone. And it definitely will. (laughs) Thank you. I guess we should, should sign out now. (laughs) Yes. Wait, what about our secret reveal? We're doing it. We're doing it now. Oh, we do it at this time. <laughs> My name is Mandy Mac. <laughs> and I am Chris River. <laughs> and we're here with Britta. <laughs> and we are Pull on the Call. We are, we are signing off. Signing off. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. can I do that? Ha, ha, ha.